All right, everybody, thanks so much for joining us on this live webinar. Super excited to have our esteemed guest here is actually also one of my mentors, Russell Gray. Uh, very excited for you to come on the show here, Russell, and talk to us uh, a lot about what's going on in the market. You're plugged in about as good as anybody, and I've learned a ton from you, and I really wanted to have you on the show to talk to my audience a little bit about what's going on and uh, where we might be headed, because it's definitely interesting times right now. So, Russ, thanks so much for coming on board. Yeah, thank you. It's great to be here. So thank you. So why don't we start a little bit? Uh, I want to get to the meat of everything that's going on. But just before we do, maybe give us a, a quick update or a background about yourself for people that are just getting to know you. That might be possible. Not everyone knows you yet, but maybe just a brief background and uh, specifically what you went through in, in 08 and kind of where this, this fire for learning the macroeconomics really came from. Yeah. So yeah, I, you know, I'm an old guy and I have a long history, so I won't bore you with all the details, but I started out life early getting into real estate and business uh, in my, in my late teens. And I'd already uh, bought and sold a property and bought and sold a business by the time I was 20 years old. And I learned about equity. I learned about the importance of mentors. I probably have made way more mistakes than I've done things right, but every step of the way I learned and so in um, the mid 90s, I started really studying the financial system after the 1987 crash and was trying to understand why my father, who was a brilliant entrepreneur and a very successful guy, took a company public and then lost everything in 1987. Uh, after you know a decade of hard work, and it was tragic. And so I, I quit the securities business, which I was in at the time, and went back into corporate sales and began to study. And um, I, it f seemed to me like there was going to be a shift of money into the bond markets, which would drive interest rates up. And that's germane to our later conversation. The principle is, is that when people bid up bonds, yields go down. So I felt like there would be a big opportunity to be in the debt business and the point of entry I chose was a mortgage business. So in 1999, I wrote a business plan to create a financial mentoring program. And in 2000, I started a mortgage company. And in 2001, I met a guy named Robert Helms, who was hosting a show called The Real Estate Guys Radio Show. And I went to one of his seminars and I realized this guy was an amazing talent and there was a lot of untapped potential. And so I approached him about a cooperative marketing. He was in real estate brokerage at the time with his father, Bob. Uh, I was um, a mortgage broker and said, why don't we get together and do financial education on this mentoring club model that I've got and see what happens. And so we did that. And it uh, just took off. It was just amazing. You know, within a few years, got two or three years. By 2004, we had nearly a thousand people in our mentoring program. This was a live meetup at a local hotel, started with nine people, grew to a thousand. We were um, obviously doing a lot of loan business. We were doing a lot of real estate. We started syndicating. We did a real estate development company. We had a TV show. We wrote a book. I became the co-host of the show in 2004. It was like it was like the Midas touch. Everything we touched turned to gold. And it was fantastic right up until it wasn't. Now, right towards the end of it, we started getting into a friendship with Robert Kiyosaki and the Rich Dad folks, and I'm sure everybody knows who Robert is. And Robert, around 2005, 2006, began sounding the warning signs, uh, the warning bells of what was going on in real estate. Back then, we didn't know Peter Schiff. We got to know Peter Schiff later, but he was another guy. He and Robert were two guys that were sounding the alarm bells. And so uh, instead of being humble and curious and listening to what he had to say, I thought I was smart and I was busy rebutting everything he said, sailing aggressively into a storm, didn't understand how dependent I was upon healthy credit markets until in 2008, those credit markets imploded. And when they did, my mortgage business failed. All of my over leveraged real estate failed. Uh, I had no operating capital because I was fully deployed and dependent upon those healthy credit markets, those American Express cards that you could run up to the moon every month. Uh, all that got shut off due to no fault of mine. It wasn't because I was defaulting. Home equity lines of credit, lines of credit I had, business loans, everything was being shut off. And it was happening so fast. So it was a complete implosion. And like my father, 20 years before, I lost everything. And I came out of that experience and I said to myself, just like I told my dad, okay, my self-worth is not my net worth. Good thing. And everything I've been through has actually made me smarter. 
Now, it didn't make me smarter like I knew what happened. It made me smarter in that now I, I could I had an experience that was going to drive me to study. And starting in 2008, we began to seek out the people. Now, first of all, we started listening to Robert Kiyosaki instead of just rebutting him. And when he decided to get back into real estate, he wrote a book called The Real Book of Real Estate. And his press team asked, uh, contacted our radio show and asked if they could promote that book, The Real Book of Real Estate. And so we said, well, great. Yes, we want to know. That's where we met Kenny McElroy, Tom Wheelwright. We got to know the new Rich Dad team. Uh, our real uh, relationship with Robert Kiyosaki and the Rich Dad group really expanded uh, at that time. Uh, we also sought out Peter Schiff, was, who was a guy that was on record vociferously warning about what was going on. And we became friends with Peter, invited him to our investor summit, and we began using our annual investor summit, not as a showcase to show how smart we were, because we by now had been humbled, but really to use it as an opportunity to gather with some of the most brilliant minds, not just in real estate, because that was one level of interesting, but we realized that we needed an outside view. And so one of the correlations that we notice is that when real estate was dropping, gold was appreciating. So we got very active in the gold community, met a lot of really smart macro people there. Uh, we started going to other conferences where macro speakers were. We started interviewing them on the show and inviting them on the summit. And it took me uh, quite a few years to really begin to understanding uh, the, the, the mechanics of the financial system. And the difference between the economy, the financial system, and the currency, how they all interrelate, and how to begin to look a little further up the cause and effect food chain so that I could see things coming sooner. Um, I started going out on the record with my hypotheses about what I thought was going to happen and why, and I would test that against these smart people. And when they began to see things the way I saw it and talk about the things I saw, and I knew you know, that I figured it out kind of on my own, it made me feel like, okay, I'm beginning to understand this. And I started being a little bit more bold. Eventually, I ended up on panels with some of these people, which was a fantastic honor. I'm still way in over my head every time. But I think if I have a gift, it's the ability to, I, I'm, I'm multilingual. I speak real estate. I speak macro. I speak precious metals. And so I think my my claim to fame is that I have a good enough understanding to help people build a base of understanding. So that when they hear these truly brilliant people who are way past me talk, you you kind of actually can understand what they're saying. And I think it's really important now for any Main Street investor, even if you think you're insulated from Wall Street, you're not. The shenanigans that go on a Wall Street roll downhill and they land on Main Street. <laughs> And they create both challenges and opportunities. And so if you recognize the challenges soon enough, you can navigate your portfolio out of the way. And if you recognize the opportunity soon enough, you can navigate your portfolio to benefit. So now I spend most of my time helping people in that regard, both on the show and our investor mentoring club and our syndication mentoring club. And of course, doing any, any guest appearances I can do on shows like this. So thank you for having me. Yeah, you bet. I'd probably add to your repertoire there, the, the fourth language you speak is the common folk language, right? You're able to, to break down all those complex uh, topics so that people can really understand it. And that's that's primarily why I wanted to bring you on the show today was that so we could dive into some of these topics. And, and eventually I would like to bring it home to how it affects real estate because a lot of our listeners are investors uh, they, they're either active or passive within real estate. So I want to get there eventually, but I, I do want to take the Russell Gray approach and start at the top, the big picture and, and kind of work our way down. So if it's all right with you, maybe we could explore a little bit more about the bond markets. We've certainly been hearing a lot more about it on main street. We've been hearing a lot more about it recently, but obviously it's a, a huge driver of the economy, but, um, but maybe you could help break it down for us on how the bond markets are really creating the credit facility and how that's how interest rates are affected by that and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, in 2012, <clears throat> which was our first investor summit, <clears throat> excuse me, um, after uh, we, we were humbled and we invited the Rich Dad crew to come uh, and G. Edward Griffin. Uh, and the theme was to talk about the Fed. Ed wrote the book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, for your listeners who aren't familiar. It's a fantastic read. Put your tinfoil hat on and get ready to be freaked out 
Uh, it was the book that woke me up in 1995, the book that triggered Dr. Chris Martinson into creating the crash course. It was the second book of two, the first being The Grunch of Giants. It really got Robert Kiyosaki triggered. And so uh, it's a book that really opens your eyes to the way the financial system works, especially with regard to the Fed. And I think if you follow the mainstream news, you hear the Fed in the news all the time and specific to their interest rate policy. Obviously, as real estate investors or any investors, we care about interest rates. That's really the price of money. And so you have this big behemoth uh, that is in the marketplace proactively managing the price of money. And money is something that we all deal in. We earn money, we save money, we borrow in money, we pay our taxes in money, we denominate our net worth in money. We're always trying to accumulate more money. And so money is important. And the price of money is important, especially if you're going to be using debt. But the price of money also dictates the price of assets. And so you can imagine as a real estate investor, if I can go buy a property that has a cap rate of, say, eight, and I can borrow money at five, well, that's a pretty good deal because I'm going to make a positive spread on the, on, on, the, on the leverage, on the borrow. I borrow at five and invest at eight. Fantastic. Well, if you're in an environment where interest rates drop, then more people have more money and they can bid up the price. And so you'll see that as cap rates fall, prices rise. The same is true in the bond market. As yields fall, bond values rise. And when assets get to the price place where the prices are very high and the, and the capitalization rate or the yield has nowhere to go but up, you're in a dangerous situation because if that cap rate rises, if interest rates rise, asset values fall. That's exactly what's going on right now. The Federal Reserve has been aggressively very aggressively raising rates. And that's affecting all assets. It's affecting real estate for sure. And it's really affecting bonds. And so if your listeners have heard about the story of Silicon Valley Bank, which was the largest bank failure since uh, Washington Mutual and the second largest in history, uh, it was rooted in the fact that they had a portfolio of, of long bonds. So what they had done is they had taken their depositors' money, which are basically short-term loans from the bank's perspective. You, you put your money in the bank, you're loaning the money to the bank. The bank, you can call the loan that afternoon. You put the money in in the morning, you can take it back out the afternoon. It's a demand deposit. That's basically a callable loan from the bank's perspective. So they have these uber short-term loans and they take the proceeds and go buy 30-year bonds. <laughs> well, the problem is with the 30-year bonds, the only way they're liquid is if you sell them. And if you sell them at a time when interest rates have risen from the time you bought them, then that means you're selling them at a loss. And so if you hear the term unrealized losses plaguing the banking system, they're talking about banks that are loaded up on their balance sheet with bonds, long bonds, whose value has dropped as a result of these rising interest rates. And if they were to sell those bonds, they would realize the loss. The same thing as a real estate investor buys an apartment building for a million dollars and it drops in value to 800000 as long as you don't sell, you're okay, as long as you can hold on. But if you were in a situation where the underlying lender could call your loan and you had to sell, you would realize that loss. That's what happened to Silicon Valley Bank. And so that problem was not isolated to Silicon Valley Bank. That problem is throughout the financial system, throughout the banking system. Any institution from pension funds to corporations to central banks to regional banks to big national too big to fail banks, they all are loaded up with bonds, long bonds. And those bonds have fallen in value because of rising interest rates. So the contagion is when people in the system have pledged those bonds as collateral. Now, if those bonds drop in value, they need to potentially make a margin call. And that's what happened in 2008. It's what triggered the financial crisis. Bonds began to fall, not because of interest rates, but because of defaults in the subprime sector. doesn't matter why the bonds fall. If the bonds fall and you're short on cash and you have to sell those bonds while they're low, where the, where the value is down, it's like realizing a loss on a piece of real estate that's underwater. If you wait long enough, it might come back. But if you don't have that choice, and so that's really, that's where the fragility is in the system. So the key takeaway from that little uh, monologue is that bond values like um, real estate values are inverse of yields in the way that real estate values are inverse of cap rates. When cap rates are up, real estate prices are down. When 
uh, bond yields are up, interest rates are up, like what the Fed does, bond values are down. And we haven't seen that in decades. And so this is an environment that many people managing money today haven't seen unless they were managing money, you know, in the, the early 80s. Yeah. So, and we've heard quite a bit about contagion, right? The, the spreading of the, these issues. And you also mentioned unrealized losses. I read an article that there's uh, close to a billion dollars worth of unrealized losses uh, because of these bonds. Where the no, no, it's close to a trillion. It's about 700 billion. Uh, I'm sorry, a, a trillion. Yeah, 700, I'm off, 700. I'm, by, I'm just making zero. sure, right? Yeah. <laughs> Use euros. Um, a trillion so, here, a trillion there. And pretty soon you're talking yeah, about real so, money. I mean, it's, yeah, it's like like eight hundred billion dollars in unrealized losses, and so it, it seems like you know we're kind of like a, maybe the calm before another storm. But but from what I'm hearing from you and and reading about, like we're not out of the woods yet, and there's still a lot of unrealized losses that these banks are ha have on their balance sheet. Which way do you see this thing going and shaking out moving forward? Well, I just saw an article uh, on Yahoo Finance, and I. I think the, it was a repost of an article, maybe from Bloomberg, I'm not sure. But the short of it is the FDIC took over, I think about $114 billion in bonds from Silicon Valley Bank, and now they're bringing them to market. So that's more supply. You have the federal government who is spending about a trillion dollars a year, more than they bring in in revenue. And so those are new bonds that have to be issued to finance that debt. You also have all of the existing debt, about $32 trillion, some of which is coming due and needs to be rolled over. And so those are bond issues that are coming in. So when you have a lot of bonds coming on the market, then the potential is that you have an oversupply of bonds and the bond prices could drop. That would bring bond yields up. Of course, it exacerbates the problem. Yeah. Okay, that exacerbates the problem. So the question is, is will the Fed step in and ease and purchase those bonds the way they did in 2008? In 2008, the Fed's balance sheet going into the GFC, the great financial crisis, was about $800 billion. And it was just a slow, steady climb. And then in 2008, from 2009, it spiked to about $2.5 trillion on its way to a peak in about 2015 of $4.5 so if you think about the growth percentage from 800 billion to four and a half trillion, what is that? Like six X? No, it's yeah. more than that. Um, more than six X. Yeah, about six X. Okay. And then they they tried to ease up a little bit, like reduce their balance sheet, which means sell some of those excess bonds. And let's step back. What did they buy? They bought garbage bonds in the system and they paid par which yeah. is face value, even though that they were depreciated. So they moved the yeah. losses from, from the financial system from people like AIG and you know Goldman Sachs and the people they chose to save versus the people they chose not to save. And it was you know them picking winners and losers, which is a completely different discussion. But they basically ate all those toxic assets. In fact, they called the purchase program the toxic asset relief program. They basically just moved all that garbage off of uh, the balance sheets of the financial system players and put it on the Fed's balance sheet with the idea it was temporary. When everything came back, they would normalize their balance sheet. Well, they never did. And then COVID came along and their balance sheet went from four and a quarter trillion or something like that up to uh, nearly nine trillion. And I think it's pushing 10 trillion right now. So the idea is there are ginormous amounts of debt. Corporations were issuing debt when the interest rates were cheap because, and using them to buy back their stocks. So now that debt still exists and those bonds have lost value as a re result of interest rate um, gains. So those balance sheets have some unrealized losses. Pension funds were purchasing bonds partly because their charter required them to buy bonds. And all of their models are based on these 8% average returns. And these guys are seeing two. So you have everything from Social Security down to CalPERS to, you know, Main Street municipals, um, entities all with their pension funds in trouble. Our mutual friend, Robert Kiyosaki, wrote a book with Ted Seidel about who stole my pension. And that's what that whole story about. So there's, there's weakness there. So there's weakness everywhere because there's debt everywhere. 
and it you can see it in the unrealized losses so what you have to monitor for is what could trigger and necessitate the sale of those bonds if those bonds have to be sold and they realize the losses these companies are insolvent give you an example of silicon valley bank they had all these long bonds they also had 171 billion dollars of deposits 151 billion were uninsured and so if those uninsured depositors would have lost their money which is really what should have happened i'm not saying it's good but that's what should have happened it would have triggered a gigantic run on the entire banking system yeah. the treasury and the fed knew that so they stepped in and they indemnified that they 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 basically bought 140 51 billion dollars and so now coming back full circle to the top of this little session is 114 billion of it is they, they're going to be selling these bonds into the market to try to recoup some of that it's going to i think the article said it was going to yield maybe a 10 or 16 billion dollar hit on the fdic balance sheet based on what they project they'll sell those bonds for and i think it's notable that the fdic insures i think it's about 14 trillion dollars in deposits and they have about 125 billion in capital <laughs> and, and and that their money wow. is actually nothing but ious from the federal government meaning treasuries so guess yeah. what if they had to come up with cash guess what they would have to do sell those bonds into the market which creates again more downward pressure which is yeah. upward pressure on yield so it is a vicious cycle so anybody paying attention understands that that people who understand the way the financial system works we're, we're all like a bunch of long tail cats in a room full of rocking chairs and we're just watching very carefully like okay this thing is very fragile and it could break at any time yeah. and the question is is if it breaks or when it starts to break what is going to be the reaction and you know we can talk about that because i think those are things you know you, you never know what's really going to happen i mean i have my thesis and i'm happy to share it but i think it's just important to understand that this is not an isolated incident to even the banking sector this is the entire financial system and contagion is is when somebody's asset is somebody else's liability so if if you issue a bond i purchase your bond and you default then my asset is worth nothing my net worth is impacted by your failure and banks uh, are all loaded up they've all lent money to each other pledging bonds that have now depreciated in value so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of fragility in the system right now and it's going to require perhaps more firepower than even the federal reserve can manufacture in order to save it which is the thesis of peter Schiff's second book the real crash which has been out for a number of years but it's still a a worthwhile read for any of your listeners yeah so so if these these bonds start start coming due and there's not as many buyers for the bonds and it ends up being the the federal reserve that acts as the backstop and gobbles up these junk bonds at that point what and the federal reserve balance sheet keeps increasing increasing and we haven't really talked about inflation yet which they're trying to fight over on this on the other side of the equation there like like it seems like the federal reserve is going to be in a pretty tough spot um especially when you include the inflation in it so like how do you how do you start to see like the steps that the federal reserve needs to make when they're in this spot and let's say the, the bonds they do need to start buying up bonds um going forward how, how do you see them do you see them continuing to do more like they did with the silicon valley bank or is, is there a limit to what their balance sheet can actually take on so i think a lot of people uh, at the beginning of the gfc would never conceive that the fed could more than 10x their balance sheet and have people still have faith in the dollar yeah if you look at the macro starting from 2010 when they they began running up a lot of debt in the bailout and as they were working their balance sheet up from 800 billion to four and a half trillion major holders of u.s treasuries led by china and there was an article in the new york times in um i just i just quoted it in the last investor mentoring club um i think it was 2009 when jai bo who was the premier of china at the time uh 
really publicly chided President and then President Obama and cautioned him to make sure that they protected the Chinese investment in U.S. Treasuries, meaning don't print our dollars into oblivion and don't make our bonds worthless, yeah. right? Who cares if you get paid back in dollars if the dollars aren't worth anything? Well, that triggered a whole series of steps that the Chinese took because, yes, they issued the warning, but as any prudent person would, they began to take steps to mitigate their risk. And, of course, it's a very complex situation because they depend very much upon their trade with the United States. The dollar was still the dominant thing, uh, currency, and continues to be. And if they were to sell their treasuries, they would literally crash the bond market and ruin their own investment. So they were kind mm. of stuck between this rock and a hard place. You can't make any fast moves. But what they began to do was, was lead a movement to de-dollarize. And so what they did was they started signing bilateral trade agreements. So the way it works or has worked with the dollar as the world's reserve currency is that all international trade is settled in dollars. So if I'm Brazil and I want to buy oil from Saudi Arabia, I'm going to purchase dollars in the open market and use those dollars to purchase the oil. So I'm going to sell my currency, which means use it to purchase the currency that I need to trade in. I'm going to purchase the dollars and then I'm going to purchase the oil. And then once the Saudis get the oil, they're going to use the dollars to purchase treasuries, and which is basically their savings. And so everybody was very dependent upon the dollar. Well, these bilateral trade agreements said, we're not going to go through the dollar. We're just going to trade directly. And they signed, I think I chronicled it in the Real Asset Investing Report. They, they signed 131 of these things like in, in, in the first four or five years. Mm. Well, it didn't really start to pick up steam until uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. When Russia invaded Ukraine, the United States um, sanctioned Russia and lock them out of the dollar system and put the whole world on notice that if, if you are holding dollars and you depend on dollars for your trade and you get on the wrong side of U.S. policy, depending on whichever way the wind is blowing, mm. they could completely lock you out. So just imagine some of the fears that Main Streeters have if they're paying attention about something like a central bank digital currency. Imagine having a programmable currency that the government controls. And if you purchase firearms or if you support a political candidate that they disagree with, if your carbon score is wrong, if, if you do something they don't like and they can see it mm -hmm. because they can track everything you do with your money, then they can turn your money off or make it no good in, in, the, in, the, in the places that they don't want you to spend it. Well, that's what happened to Russia. And so Russia divested itself of treasuries, invested in gold instead for their reserves, and they began to use their energy as a way, because they're a big producer of oil, uh, to create bilateral trade agreements. And so um, there was an article actually that came out. I don't know if I um, can share my screen real quick just to show this to you. This was in um, Bloomberg Tuesday, this last Tuesday, April 18th. And the headline says de-dollarization is happening at a stunning pace. This is what this particular analyst is saying. He says the dollar suffered a stunning collapse in 2022 in its share market share as reserve currency, presumably due to its muscular use of sanctions, which is what I just, just, just described. Dollars lost about 11% of its market share since 2016 and double that amount since 2008. And so if you're a student of history, financial history like me, you realize that this, what we're experiencing today has been a long time coming mm -hmm. and it's now just starting to break. Now, are people poo-pooing the idea that the dollar could break? But if you look at what the ultimate insiders of currency is, are doing, which are the central banks, for the last two years, they've been record purchasers of gold to hold as reserves. They're de-dollarizing. And I could go a little bit into the history of the euro because the euro was born out of the uh, gold default in Nixon's 1971 when he defaulted on the gold standard. The Europeans got together and said, hey, we need to create a competing currency. And it, it has about 20% market share right now. It didn't even exist until 1999. Yeah. 
And it was born in the 70s, but it took him like herding feral cats. It took him till 99 to get it done. And so a lot of geopolitics, if you don't think this stuff with Russia and Ukraine and what's going on with China, if you don't think that matters to you on Main Street, I'm, I'm just going to encourage you to think again. Because there's a lot, we, we're, at a, we're in an economic war right now, and the stakes are high. And if this move to de-dollarize, and I'm not saying China wants to be the reserve currency because it comes with a lot of baggage. They just want to lower the world's dependence upon the dollar. Well, every dollar that isn't needed in an international trade has to go someplace. And so you can imagine if you went to a arcade and you traded in your dollars, which are good anywhere, for tokens that are only good in the arcade. But then you find out that they're good in um, all kinds of arcades and they're good in grocery stores. And so you start spending them. And then one day the owners of the grocery stores and other arcades go, you know what? We don't want to take those tokens anymore. So now you have to gather up all your tokens that you've spent everywhere else and you got to bring yeah. them back to the original arcade and that's the only place they're good. So now you've got this overload, a big supply of purchasing power of tokens in this one arcade and not enough machines. Okay, you see what's happening? See, yeah. this is what happened. When people de-dollarize globally, those dollars all come home to the United States, which is where they're good. Just like if you went to Canada and you traded in your Canadian dollars, you can't spend them here. You're either going to convert them back into dollars or you're going to go back to Canada and spend them. Yeah, so I, the concern is if these dollars come back to the United States, now we have severe inflation. And it comes back full circle. How does the Fed fight inflation? They have to raise interest rates, crush the economy. They do that, they crush the bond market. They crush the bond market, they break the financial system. So to answer your question, the Fed's between a rock and a hard place. I feel like they have a choice, save the financial system or save the dollar. I think it's easier for them to sacrifice the dollar and I think they'll print the dollar into oblivion. The third option is they're going to try to introduce an alternative to the dollar and use the subsequent, the upcoming crisis, which really they're creating, to usher in a new currency, which would be the central bank digital currency. And that's something I think any freedom-loving, privacy-loving um, person should be very, very concerned about. So there, there's a lot of things to be concerned about. The flip side of it is there are going to be winners and losers. So I don't want to end, you know, this discussion today with having people think, oh, my God, the world is ending, right? The world isn't going to end. People are still going to need food, shelter, clothing. They're still going to conduct business. They're going to need medical services. They're going to need all the basics of life. There will be an economy. The question is, is how are assets going to be valued? What mm -hmm. currency is going to be used? And how is your net worth or how is your... How is your portfolio constructed right now? And is it loaded up with things that are gonna, gonna fade off into oblivion or is it loaded up with real things that will survive the transition? And I think that's the salient question facing investors of all stripes in today's market. Yeah, I, I love that arcade example. I hadn't heard you say that before and I, I've listened to you a lot, but I really like that. And it really drives home the point of you have increased dollars chasing fewer goods right that the the essence of inflation so so going back to the the fed being in the rock between a rock and a hard place um because i want to talk about uh, interest rates a bit because that that really affects us in the real estate world uh everywhere for that matter but but i am going to bring it home to real estate so so if we know that we've got the, these dollars coming back we have inflation happening for a number of reasons which we want to go get into here but but we do have inflation and uh, and the Fed is is trying to to reel that in a bit, but they're between a rock and a hard place. So, what do you see happening with with interest rates moving forward? Knowing where they're at, and we you know got these major cracks with the Silicon Valley Bank and the bonds, inflation you know keep creeping high. Like, where do you see them going with the interest rates? Well, I, I think there's a myth that the Federal Reserve controls interest rates. 
they manipulate interest rates based okay. on their power to print money and purchase bonds or to sell bonds in their balance sheet. So they manipulate the supply and demand of bonds to manipulate the price of bonds and the, in, the, the reciprocal, if you will, of bond price is bond yield. Okay, so if they bid up the price of a bond, they're going to push down the yield. If they bid, if they if they flood the market with supply, uh, then it's going to drive down the price of the bond, which is going to push up the yield. There is this notion that the Fed could lose control, mm. and if they do, and the market decides what the price of money is, no self-respecting investor in an eight percent inflation environment is going to accept a bond yield of less than eight. Why would they do it? Sure. So the only so reason they would do it is they're speculating that rates would go down and they would make money on the appreciation. And then the only reason you would do that is because you believe that when you get paid back in the currency that bond is denominated in, it will have purchasing power. So it, it really all hinges on whether or not people retain faith in the US dollar. Nobody's going to purchase a bond denominated in dollars if, in fact, the dollar that they're going to get paid back in isn't going to be worth much. Mm -hmm. And and so this world's reserve currency discussion is, a, a, I think, a bigger discussion than I think a lot of people, you know, want to admit. So, you know, what do I think is going to happen to interest rates? I mean, I think the Fed already signaled from 75 basis point increases repetitively down to 25. So they backed off. Will they completely pivot and start reducing there's an argument out there that the only reason they rose rates uh, is so that they have the ability to lower them in the face of the next crisis, which was coming anyway. And so if you say, well, why would they do that? Why would they create a crisis just to fix it? <laughs> because in the process of creating the crisis, they're squeezing excesses out of the market. People are going bankrupt. Yeah. People are losing profits. So uh, asset values are falling. I mean, Multifamily investors, just as a case in point, or REITs are feeling the pain. So what they're doing is they're extracting some of the air out of the bubbles in the market, and they're trying to do it without destroying everything. However, they are destroying people and businesses and institutions. Of course, the properties will continue to exist, right? I, I, I like to use the Empire State Building as an example. Uh, the plans to build the uh, Empire State Building and the project began on the front end of the Great Depression. Well, they went ahead and finished the project, but the original owners got completely wiped out. But yeah. if you go to New York today, guess what's still there? Mm -hmm. The real asset of yeah. the Empire State Building. So somebody was a loser and somebody was a winner, but the underlying asset stayed. So when you're yeah. dealing with real assets, there's always hope as an owner, that as long as you can find uh, the right structure, you'll be able to weather whatever the storm is. And then, of course, as an investor, for those who are wrong-footed, there's the opportunity to grab those real assets that retain real value over time um, when the pricing is, is right. And that's, of course, why we teach syndication, because when conventional capital markets, credit markets fall apart, it's an opportunity for private capital to step in when people who don't have access to private capital don't know how to aggregate private capital can't play. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there's big opportunity coming. I'm bullish, you know, if for the right people who are aware and prepared, I'm very excited about it. I'm not happy for the people who are going to be caught wrong footed. I'm encouraging everybody to hedge. And I think for people who don't know what else to do, the simple hedge is just take a good solid look at precious metals as a way to be outside the banking system and outside the currency and wait and see what happens to the financial system and wait and see what happens to the currency. And then whatever currency rises in its place, you can then sell your gold into and, and capture that particular currency. If it's a central bank digital currency, if it's the yuan, if it's um, the euro, if it's some re new reversion version of the dollar, um, it doesn't really matter. Or in some cases, for in a community of people who prize gold, you might be able to trade directly. You ever see the movie John Wick? Yeah. 
Yeah. So in the movie, John Wick, you know, these guys are going around and they want to deal privately and they want to have money that's good everywhere. You know, they walk into the room and they just slide that gold coin across the, the desktop. Right. Yeah. And so it's, it's kind of like that. So it's, it's, it's not a bad idea to have some of that in your portfolio. Obviously people that recognize that um, a year ago or in better shape than the people today, gold's are, you know, hovering around 2000, I think for only the third time. Yeah. Um, but I, I, there's people who think it, has a lot more to run in terms of dollar, which means the dollar has a lot more to fall. Yeah. That's the inverse of it. So, yeah, I want to get into gold and real estate here. Um, as we start to wrap up, remind people, if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. I'm sorry, not the chat, the Q and a, and we'll be going over those at the end here. Uh, so yeah, add any questions you might have in the Q and a, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, with the gold and yeah, we're over 2000 an ounce again, uh, today. Um, pretty rare but it's definitely at its peak so uh, a question like a, i guess shifting gears to like investment strategy with respect to gold and real estate you had mentioned um you know the statue of liberty analogy i see it over your, your shoulder there i've yeah. got i've got my flag over here we're both both diehard patriots but um with respect to like uh safety of capital um gold being one one spot you mentioned because it's out of the system but then you also have cash producing real estate, uh, a hard asset cash producing real estate, which is a, another great spot. What do you think investors should be looking at in terms of the, the complex, complexity with the Fed and the, the dollar decreasing uh, versus moving some, some assets into hard assets or into gold? Like any suggestions or things that you think people need to be looking at as investors from that regard? So, um, as you know, because it's a presentation that's inside our syndication mentoring club platform and our investor mentoring club platform, uh, I created a portfolio strategy I call real asset portfolio strategy. And um, what I basically did was I sat down and I asked myself around 20, maybe 15 or 16, if I could go back in time, knowing what I knew then and coach myself up heading into 2008, what do I wish I would have known and how would I've constructed a portfolio? And uh, I say all the time, what you think and believe affects what you do and what you do affects the results you produce. So if all this sounds very philosophical, it's because you do have to have a personal investment philosophy and it guides your decisions. And so when I looked at Ken McElroy, who prospered enormously going through 2008 and alongside him, Robert Kiyosaki, I said, what was their core message? Cash flow cash flow. And even though asset prices, their asset prices, just like everybody else's went down, but it didn't matter because their cash flow was strong. So I said to myself, okay, there's different types of wealth. And what I concluded is that there is air, there is faux wealth or what we'd call fake wealth. And that is wealth that's based on an asset price that is determined through comparative sampling. So if I have, say, 10 homes in an economy worth with a million dollars and the 10 homes are identical, there's no other goods and services, there's no other properties or assets to own. If you were to divide the amount of purchasing power in the marketplace, a million dollars by those 10 homes, you would have each house valued at about $100,000. Well, if in the course of doing business, one of those 10 um, uh, homeowners, the people in, in the marketplace, managed to accumulate $200,000 and decided that they wanted to purchase somebody else's house, they could purchase that house for $200,000. There is $200,000 of purchasing power in the economy based on the million dollars, which is fine. And the person who sold the house got the money. Fantastic. The problem is the other nine people now, based on the concept of comps, comparative analysis, or believe that their house is also worth $200,000. So if you take all 10 houses times the new paper price of $200,000, how much money needs to be in the economy? A lot more. Two million. But yeah. guess what? It's not really there. So if anybody or everybody goes to sell, the, the error all comes out and it reverts back to its real price. Mm. Okay. So that's a concept. Same is true with, you know, Apple stock. If you, if there's say, you know, a hundred million shares of Apple stock out there and some guy sells a thousand shares for $200, the other hundred million share owners are all deemed to be worth a thousand or two hundred dollars also but they're not 
So if you're looking at your 401k statement or the equity in your real estate, if you're looking at your balance sheet and you're determining your, your net worth by assets minus liabilities, I'm mm -hmm. here to tell you, I think that's a mistake. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're measuring your net worth by number of ounces, number of doors, uh, barrels of oil, bushels of wheat, right? Things that are real, that's real wealth. Let me put it in a different terminology. Let's say, for example, if you had a net worth of $10 million because you owned um, $20 million in real estate at break-even cash flow, and you have half a mil uh, you have $5 million of debt on it or $10 million of debt. So you have $20 million of real estate minus $10 million of debt. So you have $10 million of equity and you have zero cash flow. And you say, well, I'm worth $10 million. Okay, I would argue, by the way, I make valuation, you're worth zero. Because all of that air can come out. I had it happen to me. Yeah. Now, let's say that you had um, a portfolio of real estate that was generating a million dollars of net income to you per year. In a 10 cap world, in a 10% yield on capital world, what is that million dollars worth? 10 million. 10 million dollars. I don't care how much equity you have or don't have. What matters is if you discount the value of your cash flow to determine your net worth based on the going rate, that's a better measurement. Okay, yeah. so go back to Robert Kiyosaki's game, cash flow. When you're trying to build wealth, you're trying to build streams of passive income. That's real wealth. Why? Because going back to this comparative sampling, let's say you own... Um, apartment buildings in a particular market. And in that particular market, it's 90, 95% absorption, meaning there's only 5% vacancy. So that means that the rent, the income, which is what you're deriving your true net worth from, isn't based on a comp. There mm -hmm. aren't 10,000 apartment units sitting empty and one guy rented one unit. And you say, okay, all the rest of the empty units are worth the same just because he rented the one. That would be based on comps. No, it's based on the buyer, uh, which is the tenant, and the seller, which is the landlord, consummating a real transaction in the real world for a real exchange of value every single month. That's real. And if you go back and look at the history of the, the collapses, you see that rents are far more stickier than asset values. Okay. And so, and, and you'll see that this is one of the concerns because we've seen it had a lot of rent appreciation lately. Mm -hmm. And one of the concerns for anybody tracking the inflation problem, you'll hear them say, the problem is we've got a big chunk of the inflation is coming from housing costs, rents. And you'll hear them use this word. It's sticky. Yeah. Well, if you're on the other end of that stickiness, that's good. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. So just be careful. Just be okay. careful. Buy low, sell high is a round trip that gives you a bank account full of dollars, a tax bill, and, and transaction fees. And what do you really have? You have a bank account in, a, in, a, in an institution that is financially weak with counterparty risk and a currency that's falling in value. Yeah. Why would anybody want to make that round trip? Yeah. Right? I want to, if I have cash, if I have a business generating cash, I want to convert that cash into cash flow by using it as a down payment and pairing it with debt to purchase income and creating streams of positive income and calculating my net worth that way. The thing I would say about things that are like precious metals in, in that, I don't consider gold an investment. I'm not purchasing it low, trying to sell it high. So I end up with dollars. I consider it liquidity and savings as an alternative to dollars, not in the banking system, not exposed to the currency. And so it's a place to store both equity from my real estate because I can use a cash out refinance to create tax-free cash and purchase gold and then use that to stay liquid waiting for the next buying opportunity, not exposed to the banking system. Now, there is friction, but I think you could make the argument that if you know what you're doing, you can eliminate a lot of that friction by just knowing when to time the buy. But again, it's, it's, it's about anchoring your balance sheet with a hedge so that if everything fell apart, you have purchasing power that transcends a financial system and transcends a currency. And so that's the role of gold. To me, that's the role of real estate. And the objective is to accumulate streams of passive income. I'll say one more thing. 
you hear a lot of talk about a 60-40 portfolio in paper assets, the idea you want to be exposed to inflation, which would be equities, stock prices going up, and you want to be protected against deflation, which would be bonds, a more secure or safe uh, position. But when you understand that bond values fall in the face of rising interest rates, that is a little frightening. And so, and the yields aren't that great. So to me, if you want to have debt in your portfolio, use a first position mortgage. And I would consider a first position mortgage a real asset. Somebody says, well, it's paper. Well, is it? Think about it. That first position mortgage is secured by the income of the borrower. That's real. They're getting up and doing real work, generating real income and paying it to you. That's real. And again, going back to my concept that streams of um, income, passive income is real wealth and you can use whatever you know, cap rate you want to break into, you know, if it makes you feel good to say what my net worth is, who cares what your net worth is, what's your passive income? Um, then, uh, then, then, you know, you, you're going to get that income. Now, if you say, well, I got counterparty risk. Yes, you do. But if you buy a bond and your counterparty fails, you have no recourse. Nobody's going to step in and take that person's place. There is no value left. The, the promise to pay is bad. With secured debt, which is a mortgage, you're either going to get the payment or you're going to get the asset. When you get the asset in real estate, you have multiple exit strategies. Mm -hmm. I can sell the asset and get my cash back and go make another loan. I can sell the asset to a new buyer and create a new loan against the same asset. And when they make a down payment to move into that position, they're actually lowering my basis, but my 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 loan is going to be the same or higher depend on the market value of the property at the time. Yeah. I could rent the property out, pick up the tax breaks, the upside appreciation and have enough income to service the debt and then some. I have to take on the landlord responsibilities, but I'm getting the owner's benefit. So I have multiple exit strategies. Yeah. So if I'm going to have debt in my portfolio, I much prefer mortgage debt than I would bonds. Because you're not trading the mortgage on the open market based on discounts. You're you're actually holding it for the production of income, real wealth, and you're gonna it's backed up by something that's real. Either you're gonna get the income or you're gonna get the asset with multiple exit strategies. Yeah. I love it. So so everyone watching this, do you now know why I have Russell as one of my mentors? <laughs> I mean, this guy's a, a wealth of knowledge and super helpful. And I know there was a lot there that we uh that we went over, a lot to unpack. Um, it is going to be recorded. Well, there's going to be a recording, right? People can yes, watch it. It, it will okay. be recorded so you can rewatch it because um, I know I, I've heard this stuff a few times and it, it takes a while to sink in. So you might have to go over that part of it again. It, it's really, I mean, Chad, it's really, it's why we created the Investor Mentoring Club. It, it's to give people a chance to come every month and hear variations on a theme. The principles are the same. Mm -hmm. It's just how do you really implement it and and how do you tweak it based on what's going on in the marketplace? How do you apply it to multifamily? How do you apply it to short-term rental? How do you apply it to multifamily? How do you apply it to uh, energy investing? How, how do you understand really what's going on? What's the difference between physical and paper gold? And just there's a lot to learn. Oh, yeah. So if if you just want to turn your money over to somebody and forget about it, you know, Wall Street has designed itself to prey upon your ignorance and naivete. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's a dangerous place to be. Yeah. I think that if you want to be a real asset investor, you're going to need a degree of education. But there are ways to do it fairly hands off. You got to be smarter than if you're a paper asset investor, in my opinion. But you don't have to be driving neighborhoods, looking at properties. You don't have to be out in a gold mine, digging up, panning for gold. I mean, you know, the, there, there, are, there are networks that you can plug into where you can find all the resources that you need. In fact, you know, we have one in our, in our provider network. And I know, Chad, you have a big network. And so it's just important you get plugged into a community of people that are like-minded, that are studying things. That, and you just understand that the mainstream news, the stuff you hear, they're talking a book. They're sucking up to their advertisers. They believe in a philosophy, which is buy low, sell high. And they're very supportive of um, traditional uh, institutions like stock brokerages and Wall Street and conventional banks and life insurance companies. And we all use those tools to a degree, 
but we use them as tools to focus on the main thing, which is a portfolio of real assets generating tax advantage cash flow and hedges against failing financial systems, credit markets, and currencies. That's the gist of what we're after and what we do in the Investor Mentoring Club. Yeah, I love it. As CSQ's got very similar thoughts on that. You know, our tagline is freedom through passive income. And we just submitted our uh, our Q1 reports. And uh, I was happy to report that we didn't miss a single distribution on any of our stabilized assets for uh, all of 2023 so far. So super Congratulations. proud Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, super proud of that. But to your point, I mean, look, I've been learning from you, right? Cash flow, cash flowing assets. And uh, I do value add with my construction background. So that that really helps. But um, yeah, cash flow is, is really, really important. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. I wanted to uh, go through a few of our questions that I see uh, coming through here. And then um, and then maybe at the end, we can talk a little bit more about SMC and IMC. So okay, um, one of the questions that came in was, uh, why do people refer to the two-year and 10-year inverting so much? And what does that mean? So the yield curve is the ratio between short-term bonds and long-term bonds. And the idea is that if you're going to invest money for the long-term, you're going to demand a higher rate than for the short-term. So that's a normal curve. When the yield curve inverts, it's usually a sign that the, um, the, the investors in the bonds have concerns about the long-term prospects. And so it's uh, I think George Gammon says it's predicted all but one of the last 17 recessions. And so that's why people pay attention to it. It's a leading indicator uh, of economic concern. So I, I pay attention to a couple of different things. I like to watch the mortgage markets um, and not just because I care about what's going on with interest rates, but life insurance companies, mortgage companies, bond investors, are all paying attention. They're actuarial geniuses, right? These guys crunch numbers to the nth degree. Yeah. They take in, they have all these sophisticated financial models, all these quants that are in there grinding out the numbers and they're putting in all these inputs. If you have any questions about that, read Ray Dalio's book, Principles. He talks a little bit about it. Um, but but they're trying to decide how what the what the risk premium they should extract out of an investment and whether an investment is worth the risk. And so whoever you're paying attention to um, is going to give you some insight into what's coming. And when you see credit markets starting to get tepid, when you see credit card companies reducing credit limits, when you see mortgage companies raising lending limits, when you, when you see those credit markets begin to tighten, it tells you they see a recession coming, that they see economic weakness coming. So all the two-year, 10-year and the yield curve analysis is just the way Wall Street looks at it. But you know, however you choose to look at it, it's worth paying attention to because these guys are seeing something. doesn't mean they're right. Mm -hmm. But again, to George's point, all but one of the last, I think, 17, it's 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 indicated. So it's a pretty darn strong indicator. So what does it mean from recession? It means maybe you want to start getting liquid, realizing that people who aren't realizing that trouble is coming are going to get caught flat-footed, and they're going to be investing aggressively into a storm, get caught flat-footed, their equity will get wiped out, and those assets will be available for pennies on the dollar. And that's when somebody who understands what's going on can step in. Well, good thing the government keeps changing the definition of a recession for us. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> we won't go there. Um, all right. Another question was, uh, why are there so many Federal Reserve presidents? So the system is made up of uh, 12 banks, but really the only ones that matter are the ones that are part of the FOMC and they have uh, permanent positions and then they have some rotating positions. The idea originally is, in the way I understand it, and I'm not going to sit here and pretend I'm an expert. I'm not Daniel D. Martino Booth or G. Edward Griffin. Uh, they both have different views of the Fed, but they both understand the Fed. But the idea is that it was supposed to be a representative committee of bankers that influenced the Fed. But at the end of the day, it's the New York Fed that kind of runs the show, my opinion. And these, uh, there's a couple of other people that, that have permanent votes and then people that rotate in and out. Mm. Uh, I think the reason they have them candidly, and this is just my tinfoil hat, is, is so that they can send mixed messages into the market. 
And if somebody misspeaks, they have somebody that can come yeah. adjust it. They they manage the yeah. mood of the market with their mouth. And so they have to have more than one mouth because if somebody steps in it, then they lose credibility and they have to have another mouth come out and and and, and direct the narrative to control the mood of the market. Got it. All right. So we can read uh, the creatures of uh, the creatures from Jekyll Island if we want to learn. Yeah, the creature from Jekyll Island by G. Edward Griffin and probably fed up by Daniel D. Mart Danielle D. Martino Booth. Okay. Let's see uh, another question. Uh, where do you think we're headed with the central bank digital currency? Do you think that'll ever be here in the United States? I hope not. I sat on a panel with Danielle DiMartino Booth at the New Orleans Investment Conference, and the topic of central bank digital currency came up. She And she knows Jerome Powell. Mm. I don't know him. I don't know that much about him. But she spent nine years inside the Fed, and before he was uh, at the premier the pinnacle position of the Federal Reserve as a chairman, he, he was in the plumbing along with her and other people. She was involved in the uh, Dallas Fed, which is one of the more prominent Federal Reserve's uh, branches or uh, divisions. Um, she said, as long as Jay Powell is sitting in that seat, there will be no central bank digital currency. That's her personal opinion. And I said, okay, that's great. So uh, to me, that's a picture of a guy standing there with his finger in the dike what happens when Jerome Powell's not in that seat? And she looked at me, she said, good point. So uh, I do think that there's going to be a lot of pressure to come up with some alternative to the dollar because I see the dollar as we know it under extreme pressure, some of which is self-induced by the Federal Reserve, some of which has been the consequences of geopolitical policy and sanctions that have frightened people who hold the reserve dollar. And that's why, again, just do an internet search on the term de-dollarization and start tracking oh, yeah. what's happening and you'll see it. Uh, and so the Fed doesn't have control over that. You know, The Fed doesn't really have control over what the government does. The Federal Reserve is not part of the government. So that, that's one of the, the concepts in the creature from Jekyll Island. The Federal Reserve is not federal, <laughs> has <Yeah>. no reserves, <laughs> and it's not a bank. <laughs> that's so crazy. Other than that, you know, <laughs> so the name is really a misnomer. Yeah. So it's meant to be independent. Uh, uh, you, you can argue the pros and cons of that. I don't think it should exist, you know, and so that's a different discussion. There's a lot of folks that like George Gamma that think the Fed just, Ron Paul, the Fed shouldn't even exist, but it does. Danielle DiMartino Booth thinks it needs to be reformed, but it should exist. Okay. Mm. At any case, um, their monopoly on power is the dollar. I can't imagine they're going to give up that monopoly, even if the dollar as we know it fails. Therefore, mm. I think there is tremendous pressure to come up with an alternative. And I think that alternative is almost certainly going to be the central bank digital currency. Gammon says it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Okay, we'll see. Uh, Daniel T. Martino Booth says, as long as Jay Powell's there, it's not going to happen. But she didn't have a backup for that. Mm -hmm. So it really depends maybe on who the next Fed chair is. It depends really on what uh, the rest of the world does in terms of de-dollarizing. It depends a lot on what the, the government does in terms of spending um, and uh, inflation, which is a byproduct of government spending. Yeah. Um, and so how quickly will we have a crisis that will require the replacement of the dollar as we know it? I don't know. Uh, if you put the conspiracy hat on and say the central bank digital currency is an overt design of central planners and they're lock licking their chops to have complete control and visibility into the entire uh, economy down to the individual's decision for what they have for dinner, uh, at, at the local restaurant, um, you know, then again, it could be sooner or later. And then the flip side of that is, will the people accept it? Will the people push back? People have been moving into Bitcoin. I don't think that's a secret. People have been moving into gold. I think people are looking for alternatives. If a viable alternative pops up that the people can access that doesn't get outlawed, um, then maybe the central bank digital currency wouldn't get a hold. But you've got to realize that if the, the central bank digital currency is got the support of the government and the regulators by executive order, just the same way FDR took away everybody's gold. They could outlaw Bitcoin. They could outlaw cash. Yeah. And, 
and, and they could force you into this digital currency. And at that point, having a community of people you can barter with and hope that the challenges that would likely ensue all the way up to the Supreme Court will yield in an, in, in an overturn of that executive order. Uh, but that's the way I would see it playing out. So I think you can't know exactly what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I think you watch it. You build your local community, another part of what our investor mentoring clubs are all about. You have alternatives to the currency that you can trade with that are universally accepted, like gold and silver, maybe something like ammo, uh, which is a barterable commodity, uh, cash outside the banking system, you know, it, as long as it's usable. If you can't use cash, then, you know, you, diamonds, something that you can trade with that's universally accepted. Um and, and, you know, Bitcoin, I'd, I'd be careful. I mean, you know, we've seen like Coinbase, for example, is talking about moving their operations offshore to get out from underneath jurisdictions. Uh, meanwhile, there's movements to create national regulation through the UN. So I just think if it's tech, it's tracked. I'm not trying to throw shade at crypto. I think blockchain is awesome. Anything that is an alternative to century planned currency, I'm a fan of. But I do have concerns about technology as opposed to just a hard asset you can put in your pocket. You know, there's there's pros and cons to both. But I think you have to have everything. Just watch it. And, um, you know, of course, again, people like us are going to be talking about it. And and uh, nobody really knows, but we're all watching. Hopefully somebody will see it break soon. And if you're in the know, if you're plugged into the network, you'll hear about it early too. Yeah, great. Okay, last question we've got here. Uh, similar thought on this, actually, central bank digital currency. Uh, do you think we'll ever go back to a gold-backed dollar? Um, we may not go back to a gold-backed dollar, but the world might go to a gold-backed currency. Mm. Okay. So um, there's been talk that China, for example, uh, who nobody trusts as a counterparty, that's why everybody says, oh, China's yuan could never be a uh, currency because they don't respect the rule of law is with all its faults, the United States still reflects the rule of, uh, respects the rule of law, unless you're Russia inviting, invading Ukraine, in which case then your money is no good. And we're going to take it away from you, even though it's yours. Mm -hmm. Right. So, okay. So it's maybe not as good a rule of law as it once was. Um, but I think that the minute you introduce into the global economy, a currency that is backed by gold, as long as there isn't a law in the United States to prevent you from trading in it, you'll trade in it. So let me give you an example. In Venezuela, the Bolivar began to fail. Socialism drove everything into the ground, not enough goods and services. They tried to fix the production problem by printing money, which exacerbated the problem. They printed the print money into oblivion. People who owned gold or U.S. dollars survived in an entire black market of trading for both gold and U.S. dollars existed mm. because people knew that they could spend those money outside the system. If, if I traded with you the fruit of my labor for the fruit of your labor, and I ended up with a profit and I ended up with some gold, as long as I can get outside the country, I can trade that gold uh, for goods and services or currency that I can actually use. And the dollar for a lot of third world countries, or not even third world countries, but other countries is considered to be a better currency than their home currency. Okay. So, um, so I think, I think that, um, I think that if, if, if we get to a situation where a coalition of nations who have pushed back against the dollar were to come together, let's say Russia and China, and Russia says, hey, we're going to sell our oil only in this currency, kind of the way the United States got uh, a lot of um, demand for their currency when they introduced their relationship with Saudi Arabia back in the 70s and all dollars, all oil had to be purchased in gold. If if Russia said all oil from us needs to be purchased in this currency, they're going to create global demand for that currency because the world has a global need for oil and Russia has a ton of it. If China said, hey, if you want to buy our goods and services, largest manufacturing economy on the planet, you got to pay us in this currency backed by gold, then you're going to have to find a way to get that currency. 
Yeah. If if and you don't have to trust China, if this in fact currency is is you can take it to the Shanghai Gold Exchange, which is doing a ton of business set up as an alternative to the London uh, markets, which has been the gold trading capital of the world, and you can trade those currencies in for real gold. Well, all of a sudden you don't need to trust China. You don't need to trust China and you don't need to trust China to manage the value of its currency because you have the ability to convert it back into something real gold. If that happened, then I think that there would be a big black market, even in the United States, in that currency. Now, would that force the United States to come forward and say, hey, we're going to participate? We're going to back our currency with gold too? Then it begs the question, how much gold do we really have? <laughs> Allegedly, there's eight thousand plus tons of gold in Fort Knox. However, hasn't been audited since the 1950s. So nobody knows if it's really there. Yeah. Meanwhile, China says, hey, we have about 4,000 tons, but they're one of the world's largest, if not the world's largest producer of gold, and they export zero. They're the largest importer of gold, yeah. and they're a communist nation. <laughs> which means that all of the gold of their private citizen really technically belongs to the government. Yeah. And so they, they, there's been theories that they could have as much as 20 or 25,000 tons. Now, when the United States became the world's reserve currency at Bretton Woods in 1944, 1945, we had 20,000 tons of gold. And what happened is we printed too much money against that gold mm -hmm. and the Europeans figured it out and they started cashing in their dollars for gold and we went, we drew down from 20,000 tons to 8,000 tons. And Richard Nixon on August 15th, 1971 said, whoa, stop the presses. We're shutting mm -hmm. the gold window. You can't turn your dollars in, basically default it. The dollar collapsed in value. Oil went from $10, $5 a barrel up to whatever. And gas prices went from 25 cents a gallon up to a dollar a gallon. We had shortages. It was stagflation. A lot of the things you're seeing happen now were a result... Mm -hmm. um, were the same as what happened in the 70s. And what happened in the 70s was a result of a collapse of the dollar. The dollar survived, but only because Paul Volcker was able to jack interest rates to up to over 20%. But our GDP to debt ratio back then was only 35%. Today, it's 135%. So the problem when you jack interest rate up with that much debt is exactly what's happening. Our debt service, how much time do I have? Can I show you something real quick? Sure. Okay, I so this I'll is be a replayed a lot because we've covered a lot, but it's good. This is good stuff. Well, I, I I'll see if I have it. I want to see if I can show it. Maybe, um, sorry, maybe it was a different presentation. It was a different presentation. So I'm uh, no. Let's see, clues in the news. Let's see, it's right here. Nope. <laughs> sorry, I'm ruining your whole show. No, uh, I know. I know what moment, chart you're looking right, for. It's right here, one. right here. Okay, so let me just share the screen. This was a presentation from our last investor mentoring club, and what I did in uh, an article, which um, I can show you how to find. So I'll pull it up. No, it was not going to let me do it. So forget that. So in um, because of our growing debt, this is this is the government expenditures on interest payments. Do you see how it spiked as interest rates have spiked? Yep. Okay. Th this is driving a government that's already spending more money that brings in. And now it is dramatically increasing to the tune of nearly a trillion dollars a year just in debt service. It just back if you were over leveraged, barely able to make your payments with a 5% interest card, and then you yep. miss a payment and all of a sudden you're paying 20%, your interest payment goes way up. Now you're in trouble. It's yep. part of the reason why this whole debt ceiling debate is interesting. So as a result, you can see that the government has had to increase tax collections. In 2020, they collected a net of $2.76 trillion. So after they collected the gross revenues issued refunds, 2.76. In 2021, 3 trillion. 2022, 4.26 trillion. Audits have gone up in 2020 from 500,000. They went up by 50% in 2021 to 750,000. Of course, we know the IRS has just received in, in, in the Biden budget an $80 billion, um, if it gets passed, um, budget to increase audits. So the, the point is, is that you, you, know, you see a, a lot of uh, debt out there driving a lot of interest and creating a lot of tax and increasing the rate at which we're going further into debt. If, in fact, the United States doesn't have gold, 
if, if, if it comes to the world goes to a gold standard and the United States citizens realize I'm better off in a black market standard of some foreign currency that's backed by gold than the United States that's backed by nothing. Wow. Then the United States is going to be forced to come out and go, hey, here's our gold. And if it's not there, then if you're only holding dollars, you're in trouble. Yeah, hey. So my, 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 the, the warning signal, the thing that I've been beating since 2013, when I first started, realized that China was working on de-dollarizing, leading a charge to de-dollarize the currency, is, is guys understand gold. The role of gold in a portfolio is to hedge against the collapse of the banking system and a collapse of the currency. Not, you're, you're not buying it to make money. You're buying it to have an alternative. And the world is telling you they're doing the same thing. Okay, so... Will the United States go to a gold-backed currency? Not on purpose, <laughs> I don't think. But they may have to if, in fact, this coalition being led by people that may have as much or more gold than we have, as much or more energy than we have, a bigger manufacturing economy than we have, decide to go to a gold standard. In that case, it'll be like the dollar falls off a cliff. And if you're wow. not prepared for that, you will ca be caught very flat-footed. So these are very interesting times we live in. It's the reason I went back to, into the Investor Mentoring Club concept, because I want to get the word out, but it takes time and effort. So it's a premium program, not expensive, but a premium program, so that we can pay to, to do the research and bring you the analysis and all that. Yeah. But, but whether it's through us or someplace else, get plugged into a mastermind group, pay attention to these things, because... If it happens, it will happen very quickly. It'll happen slowly at first, and all the signs will be there in hindsight, and then it'll happen all at once. Yeah. So, yeah, this this is awesome. I really appreciate it. I do think this is going to get a lot of replays, and uh, all our listeners can see why I've uh, chosen Russ to be one of my mentors. And uh, maybe before we leave, Russ, because I am a part of the Syndication Mentoring Club and also the Invest Investor Mentoring Club, which I find really valuable. Maybe you can give us like a 30 second explanation of those two. And if people want to get more information on them, where can they go? So the syndication mentoring club is our answer to solving the problem, two problems in the, 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 the world. Number one is uh, our educational system is creating more job seekers than job creators. And so we are launching entrepreneurs who will be job creators. Number two is we feel that Main Street should be investing in Main Street, not Wall Street. And so syndication is the idea of someone like Chad, uh, a syndicator, going out there and aggregating private capital from private investors and buying real assets on Main Street and completely circumventing Wall Street and bringing tax bills down and um, having privacy. And there's all kinds of benefits. So we coach uh, people how to do that. We have a whole mentoring program for, for doing that. It's a community of people that are dedicated to studying, working, solving business problems. And it's based on the notion that if you have a million dollar year income in your future somewhere and you have a hundred hard problems to solve before you get to that million dollar year income as an entrepreneur, if it takes you 90 days to solve each problem, it's going to take you 24 years. If it takes you 30 days, it's going to take you eight years. If you can solve it in a week, it's going to take you two years. So it's about accelerating your success by putting you in a peer group, a mastermind group of people all working to solve the same problems you are and giving you access to that brain trust so you can advance your career faster. So if you're entrepreneurial minded, love investing, and uh, you despise Wall Street like I do, we encourage you to become part of the army. Uh, I would say just, uh, let's see, what can you do? Um, send an email to uh, syndication at realestateguysradio.com. Syndication at realestateguysradio.com. We'll tell you about our seminars and we'll get you information about that. The Investor Mentoring Club is for Main Street real asset investors. It's not about the entrepreneurial side of it. It's about making good, good decisions, portfolio decisions, all the stuff we've been talking about here. But it's based on the same premise. We get together regularly. We talk about these things. We look at what's going on in the news. We talk about real life situations and we solve problems. Mentoring is different than a course of study. If you go to a college, you get a course of study thought, taught by academics that are dealing in theory. If you've ever gotten a college degree, you know you go out in the real world with that college degree and get a job where somebody mentors you. And that's where you really learn how to do whatever you're going to do. So our thing is, let's have education, but let's have education in context. And so we give you kind of a fundamental education. And then your mission is to go start to invest, to go start to build a syndication business. And when you get stuck to have a group of 
professionals, a group of mentors and peers that you can quickly get unstuck and get the answer to the, the problem in when you're facing the problem. The old adage that the student, you know, when the uh, student is ready, the teacher appears, that's mentoring. We believe you learn faster that way. And actually your education pays for itself as you go along because you're actually doing things instead of just dealing in theory. So uh, if you're interested in that, you can actually come to our next in Investor Mentoring Club meeting for free. We have a guest pass. Just send an email to rsvp at investormentoringclub.com. And of course, we'd encourage you to listen to the Real Estate Guys Radio Show, realestateguysradio.com. And we talk about all this stuff and more and have been since 1997. Yeah, you guys have been going going at it for a while now. And I was at the Investor Mentoring Club meeting last last earlier this week, and uh, it was great. I mean, you had Tom Wheelwright, who's the tax advisor to Robert Kiyosaki on the show, and uh, you also brought on Dana Dana Samuelson, who's uh, you know an expert in in uh, gold and precious metals. And of course, yeah, we Stephanie do gold I updates every month, gold yeah. and mortgage updates every month because those great. are two things you got to watch every month. Yeah. And Stephanie Riley, who's amazing in the mortgage space, and she also has a great handle on macroeconomics. So I'll just share that with people. That was my my last meeting I was at with you guys, and it was great. So if anyone's well, Kenny McElroy's at the next one in May. So if you get a guest pass, you'll okay. get Kenny. And then after that, Seppa Com going to be talking about single family home investing. So if you're just getting started, you want to figure out how to go from. Uh, your first property to 240, which is what Sep's done, yeah. uh, then uh, Sep is a guy you're going to want to listen to. Yeah, it's a great group. All right. Well, we'll include all this stuff in the show notes uh, so people have it as well. But Russ, just once again, really wanted to thank you for coming on, sharing all your knowledge. Thanks for, for being a, a master student and continuing to learn and breaking down these complex subjects for us. Uh, for the peon so that we can understand it. We uh, we really appreciate if it. If I can understand it, you can understand it. I hope that, you understand, I knew nothing about this when yeah. I got wiped out. It was the pain of getting wiped out that forced me to become an avid student and also to become an evangelist for people. Please don't feel like you can't understand this stuff. It actually, when you learn the mechanics, it's not that complicated, but it will take you a little bit. You got to be in conversations with people that understand it and little by little, it'll start to make sense. So stay, yeah. hang in there. I encourage you. <laughs> I agree a hundred percent. All right. Well, we're going to end it here. Thank you so much for us. I really appreciate it. And we'll see you at the next meeting. Thanks, Chad. Thanks everybody. All right. Bye.